to the uh, panel on apocalypse or apocalyptic art in Japan, particularly apocalyptic art in manga and anime, since we're here to talk about Japanese pop culture. My name is Roland Nozomu Keltz, uh, and I'm, uh, as you can probably guess from that middle name, half Japanese. My mother is uh, from originally from Tokyo and Morioka, Japan, which is up north in Tohoku. And I'm the author of this book, so I'm holding up this, this sign that my publisher sent me to carry down here, uh, which is called Japan America, How Japanese Pop Culture Has Invaded the U.S. And a quick qualifier, I did not come up with the subtitle. Huh. My publisher came up with the subtitle. And the reason I say that is because part of what the book is about is that Japanese popular culture really didn't invade the U.S., it was demanded by the U.S. And so this is very much a demand-driven story. Uh, the interest in manga and anime came from Americans, and uh, Japanese companies have done, with very few exceptions, uh, not so much to promote it or even to exploit the market in the United States, which is one part of the book as well. Um, First of all, I just want to ask you, when you hear the word apocalypse, uh, what comes to mind? End of the world. End of the world. the world, sorry. That's cheap. Akira, or Akira. Interesting. What else comes to mind? End of the world? Maybe Blade Runner? Sci-fi? Films like that? Blade Runner is obviously a classic. Yes, absolutely. Yes, sir. End of Evangelion, or even the beginning. <laughs> yes, you have the alien, absolutely. In the back. The whole franchise. Okay, so we'll just take it all off. <laughs> right. Which is being rebuilt, as you know. Remade <laughs> as we speak. Yes, sir. Uh, now and then, here and there. Now and then, here and there. Yeah, yeah excellent. One more? Four Horsemen. Four Horsemen. Okay, great. Great titles, right? We're talking about classics, in a way. Great works of art. Uh, and of course, a number of them from Japan. One of the things I discovered when I first started doing research for this book, Japan America, is that so many of the initial artists, we go back to the godfather of manga and anime, who is? Osamu Tezuka. Osamu Tezuka. Tezuka Osamu, or that was. Um, Tezuka was about 17 years old when Japan was being firebombed by uh, the, the American Air Force. Uh, firebombing is, uh, of course, a, um, a technique, if you will, a strategy of ultimate, complete destruction. Japanese cities at that time, in 1945, were largely made of wood and paper, exactly. Two highly flammable materials. A general by the name of Curtis LeMay. Some of you heard that name? Anybody heard that name? Curtis LeMay? George Wallace is a running mate. Uh, That's right, George Wallace is running mate. Also known as Dr. Death in some circles. Um, he advocated a strategy called complete war. Anybody have any idea what that would be? It's similar, it's similar to what Sherman wanted to do, basically uh, annihilate the forces. Sherman was mentioned, yeah. yeah. Uh, General Sherman, who burnt Atlanta, completely burned their resources, demoralize their people, and leave absolutely nothing Absolutely behind. nothing behind. Total destruction. So, you don't just go after military facilities, you go after everybody. Uh, May came up with a list, or he asked his people to come up with a list of 17 most populous cities in Japan, and they went after each one, firebombing them. So, it didn't matter if you were a child, woman, uh, farmer, civilians went up in flames in World War II in Japan. This is not to in any way diminish the effect of two atomic bombs, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the only ones dropped in history, fortunately, uh, if, if you will. But two atomic bombs in Japan were dropped in, uh, uh, of course, in uh, 1945 in August and the war ended soon after that. So here you have this art form, manga, and eventually animation when it moved to television, that emerges out of these individuals who had this experience of total war and the destruction of Japan. 
Um, this is quite personal to me because my mother was in the bomb shelters in Tokyo when Tokyo was being destroyed. And eventually, her father, her father was able to take the family up north to Morioka um, and escape the bombing. But uh, my mother has some pretty harsh memories, as you can imagine, of that time in Japan. So here you have this guy. Let's take Tezuka as an example. As soon as I started conducting interviews for the book and started talking about uh, Osamu Tezuka, the first two names that came up were Walt Disney and Max Fleischer. Max Fleischer, some of you know Betty Boop. Superman cartoons. Cat. Yes. And they said Tezuka loved these guys. He loved Disney's Bambi so much, he claimed to have seen it 81 times. And not only had he seen Bambi, but Tezuka actually copied Bambi. There was a book that was sold in the streets of Osaka called Walt Disney's Bambi by Osama Tezuka. <laughs> Disney had no idea this was happening. Um, the book was republished um, after Tezuka's death in 1989, reissued as a kind of homage, and Disney now gets 40% of the profits. <laughs> That's a company. Um, so Tezuka loved Disney, he loved Fleischer, he loved American comics, but he also had this experience of total destruction and apocalypse in Japan in 1945. So what he produced, while of course he was influenced by these other artists, bore some reference to the war. We all, and most of us know Astro Boy, his first name, he's probably the first manga hero. Astro Boy, Ted Swan uh, you know, a uh, half, basically, boy robot created out of uh, nuclear technology. <laughs> what? <laughs> right? And this boy robot is supposed to spread peace around the world. Um, this boy robot also, while he was referred to at the time as maybe a kind of Mickey Mouse character for Japan, he's very different from Mickey. If you've read the manga or seen the series, uh, Tezuka's creation is a very worried little boy, not sure of who he is, wondering why evil persists in the world, human evil. There's a lot of darkness in the subtext of Astro Boy. And if you pursue Tezuka's work even further, you find comics based on uh, Nazi Germany, Adolf. Adolf exploring in very graphic detail the violence of the Nazi era. You find a comic based on Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Not exactly a cheery little book. <laughs> the reason I give you these examples is that right from the beginning, manga and then anime were built to carry very dark psychological themes right from the start. So that unlike American comics, which were featuring largely superheroes, or vaudevillian characters, uh, slapstick stuff, Tom and Jerry running around the table, um, Japanese comics developed this very dark psychological subtext right from the start. So when you're watching something today, and you think, whoa, man, that's really amazing. Like, how can they express that stuff? It started right from the beginning. Now, that's not to say that an artist working today referring back to World War II, of course, they have no memory, no experience of it. But from the beginning, if you wanted to make a comic where you were referring to the darkness of the Vietnam War, which a lot of, a lot of Americans don't realize that Japan was basically a launching pad for American troops during the Vietnam War, Japanese people were hired as laborers to work on American military uh, 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 munitions and so on during the Vietnam War. There were huge protests in Tokyo during the Vietnam War. Haruki Murakami, the novelist, some of you may have heard his name, mm -hmm. uh, Murakami himself protested in Japan and was beaten by police. It was a very violent period in Japanese history, the 1960s and 70s. So these artists, who had nothing to do perhaps with World War II, had this vehicle, this way of expressing very dark, angry, sometimes frustrated, sometimes traumatic, experiences, and that was manga and anime. But you can go back in Japanese history, uh, and even back to, well, we're not looking at Yamaha, hang on a second. <laughs> See if I can get that graphic back up. Okay, here we go. What is this? Anybody? Tsunami. Tsunami, um, tsunami says. Yes. <laughs> but what is the uh, image? 
Yeah, Hokusai, exactly, actually is his name. He's probably the most famous ukiyo-e, or woodblock print artist in Japanese history. Dating back to uh, the 16th century here, we have this print, which is probably the most famous woodblock print out of Japan. Anybody know the title? Yeah. The Great Wave of Kanagawa, that's exactly the title. Yes, very, very well put. And this is also, um, part of a series called 36 Views of Mount Fuji. Beautiful series, by the way. If you haven't seen Hokusai's work, I encourage you to check it out. Partly because he's often cited as a precursor of manga and anime artists. Now, one thing you notice in this picture, where is the energy? You know, sometimes when you're looking at art, you think, where's the energy? Where's the, the power? Where do you see it in this picture? In the here. 100% in the wave. 100% in the wave, yes. It is really intense, isn't it? And not just the power of the wave, but look at the tips of the wave. The edges of the foam. They're like fingers, right? Often described that way, clawing through the air as they roar above these poor uh, fishermen in their ships who are being rocked back and forth. This image naturally re-emerges after what happened in Japan in March of 2011 as a powerful reminder of Japan's intense memory, if you will, sense memory of the power of nature. Let's keep in mind when we talk about Japan, it's an archipelago, four main islands. And the size of the archipelago those four main islands, is slightly smaller than the U.S. state of California. And the habitable, habitable space of that archipelago is roughly 30 to 40 percent, because most of it is islands, uh, sorry, mountains. Mountainous terrain, hills, that are very difficult to build on. So 30 to 40 percent of that island chain that's slightly smaller than California with a population today four to five times that of California, approaching half that of the United States. It's a lot of people in a small space. In addition, those islands are, as many of you notice, uh, lo no, located on the, uh, one of the most, not the most active um, uh, earthquake region in the world. When I was there, I just flew in on Monday to the United States. When I was there, and I, I had left just before the quake, so I had this very strange experience of being away when everything happened. Still, when I was there, I felt probably 18 to 19 earthquakes myself uh, in Japan. Fortunately, none of them that severe. But uh, you know, when you're in a building and it starts to sway, and you see the pictures on the wall sway, you start wondering how much time hmm. you've got, when it's gonna happen. So you have a people in this small space, out in the ocean, smashed by earthquakes, volcanic islands, Mount Fuji is a volcano, right? And threatened by typhoons, uh, typhoons, yes, exactly. So going back to the 16th century, you have artists who are depicting an apocalyptic power. Uh, emanating from the natural world. And I want to draw your attention to something here. Some of you are, might, might be art students or art historians, you know that, that uh, of course, the Europeans were depicting ocean and violent waves and violent seas because that was sort of the way you, you were out to conquer the world. You, had, you didn't have, you know, uh, Japan Airlines or American Airlines. You had to go out and, and hit the seas. But in most European depictions, the boats are all out at sea dealing with the violence of the ocean and the crashing waves. Here, in Hokusai's image, you have Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji is a symbol of Japan, a symbol of Japanese strength, a symbol of the people and the nation. It's tiny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look at how small Mount Fuji is in this image. You have the artist depicting this enormous wave with clawing fingers and the symbol of the nation is tiny in the background, completely dwarfed by the violence 
of apocalypse, the violence of the sea. So, and Hokusai, of course, as some of you may know, actually coined the word manga, uh, the, the kanji characters. And manga means what? Does anybody know? Yeah, that's actually, you're getting a more technical definition. Irresponsible artwork or um, silly sketches, throwaway stuff, scattered stuff. Uh, Hokusai was referring to stuff that he wasn't really turning into great art. He was, you know, just sketching things, maybe silly subjects, sometimes uh, sexual subjects, stuff that he didn't intend to necessarily put out in public. So manga, if you will, is like the underground punk rock of of Japanese art, and it emerges after World War II with this tradition of being able to depict not only you know sexual, comical, etc., silly things, but also apocalypse, the end of the world. And I'm going to call upon a couple of images here just to get some of this stuff into your mind. I know you've seen some of these things before, but. Um, I made reference here to Astro Boy. What's interesting in part is that you have in Astro Boy the depiction not only of a character born out of, of radiation, but also um, Japan's new faith in technology. One of the stories in Japan America is about how Jap the Japanese population felt that they lost the war, not, every, not everyone felt this way, but one motif, one theme in Japan was that Japan had lost the war because they didn't have enough technology. If they'd only had the ships to keep up with the Americans, if they'd only had superior planes, if they'd only had enough oil, enough power. And I raise this issue because in Japan today, the question of having enough power is a very serious one. Uh, the nuclear plants, as, as many of you know, melted down in Fukushima. And uh, there's a term in Japanese uh, that's used a lot, setsuden, which is a kind of saving of electricity that people are trying to practice throughout the city. Tokyo is much darker than it used to be in the city I left because lights are being shut off in stores, down streets. Um, you're supposed to keep your air conditioner at 28 degrees centigrade, which is roughly 82 degrees. Fahrenheit, you know, not exactly point? sweet sea breezes. <laughs> what's the point um, at that temperature? Sorry? So what's the point at that, that high? Well, it's better than being out in the street if it's 114 degrees, which Tokyo reaches those temperatures just as we have <laughs> seemingly here in Baltimore today. Um, so this awareness of having technology and this faith in technology, this belief that it could somehow have saved the day. I'm gonna give you a shot of Tezuka himself. Uh, the man in the beret, this is the artist I'm talking about. And of course, he was not alone in experiencing the war. Another great master uh, of, of contemporary animation, uh, Hayao Miyazaki, was younger than Tezuka during the war. His family, both Miyazaki's family and Tezuka's family had money, so they were able to escape the city, uh, just as my mother's family had enough money to get out of the city. Very much, uh, you know, this is something that's not talked about enough when we talk about war, but war often uh, victimizes the poor in many much larger numbers than, than the rich because they're able to escape and to achieve protection. Miyazaki himself was able to escape the war, and you may wonder about apocalypse in Miyazaki's work, but if any of you have seen Naushika, uh, his, his classic film, or even a more recent film, Ponyo. What happens in Ponyo? Does anybody, can anybody recall that it has an apocalyptic aura to it? Yes. It traumatized you. It was so apocalyptic. What? Incredible scene, right? Yes. There's a scene in Ponyo, if you haven't seen it, where uh, the, the uh, mother character is driving up coastal highway in Japan. Her son is in the car, a little boy, and the ocean is, uh, there's a tsunami, basically, 
roaring up the coast, and the waves, which are personified, as so much is personified in Miyazaki's work, they're animated, they have eyes, they are roaring up the coast. They don't seem evil, as, as Miyazaki is, con you know, often you don't know what the character is behind these creatures. When he, I interviewed him in 2009 in California, I asked him about Totoro, for example, and he said, oh, Totoro, he said, when I started to create the creature, I told my staff, just focus on the eyes. Okay, if you can think of Totoro, those of you who've seen it, the eyes. And he said the important thing about the eyes is they just kind of stare into nothing. And he said the reason that was important is because you look at Totoro and you don't know if he's a genius or a complete idiot. And this is very much an essence of Miyazaki's work. You don't know if something is evil, if something is brilliant, if something is completely vacant. And those waves have eyes like that, kind of empty eyes as they're roaring up the coast. Well, when I saw that film in the cinema in Japan, I thought, wow, what a brilliant imagination Miyazaki-san has, right? Creating this roiling ocean and this sense of tension and suspense as the mother and child are racing up the coast. You know, four, three or four years later, I was watching television, and there were the waves roaring up the coast of Japan and automobiles racing to escape them on March 11, 2011. Extraordinary. And that sense I had of Miyazaki knowing apocalypse intimately and knowing that what he was depicting was very much life in Japan and a sense that Japanese would recognize that image immediately and the fear and anxiety it provoked uh, was very intense. So Miyazaki himself very much about apocalypse. And one thing that people often don't know about Totoro is that it was, it was made alongside another Ghibli film uh, called Karunohaka, or Grave of the Fireflies. And uh, yeah. both Takahata, uh, Miyazaki's uh, fellow artist at Ghibli, and Miyazaki set themselves a challenge with Totoro, which was to make a film that somehow referred to the war. Takahata, who was a child and did not escape to the countryside, made Grave of the Fireflies, which of course is all about the experience of two orphans in World War II. Miyazaki makes Totoro. Does anybody know the reference to the war in Totoro? Yeah. Go ahead. It's interesting that you mention that because in both of those films, both of those Ghibli films, the mothers are ill, right? And, and largely missing from the story. In the very beginning of Totoro, you're right on the right path, the image of the father driving into the countryside with the two children in an old jalopy type vehicle, for a certain generation of Japanese, and here I'm talking about my own mother, that image immediately calls up the war because that was the kind of car you could find in Japan at that time. You know, sort of junked, a jalopy, because the war was using up so many resources that you might be able to find an old junker like that lying around. And the kids themselves, the two girls, are wearing um, sort of mismatched clothing. It doesn't fit very well. And so they're hand-me-downs. And of course, during the war, there's a lot of hand-me-down items Partly because there's so many people who are dead, and maybe that you don't need the children's clothes because the children are gone. So another family takes the clothes and uses them. So right in the beginning of Totoro, and that escape into the countryside is very much what Miyazaki himself experienced. And in fact, the beautiful, exquisite house in Totoro, which has that European add-on section in it, is modeled on Miyazaki's childhood home. Exactly his childhood home. So he, in fact, is referring to the war in a much more subtle fashion in Tokyo. But both films immediately to a certain generation of Japanese call upon us. Can I suggest they close that door back there? Yeah, that's an excellent idea. Can somebody close the door so maybe uh, you won't be uh, hearing a harsh hearing. Hear para, para. Hear, yeah.
want to show a couple of quick clips to you um, to talk about apocalypse and Japanese art. Yes. I actually heard that uh, Grave of the Fireflies and Totoro were screened as a double feature. That's exactly right. Um, that was partly because uh, he just said that they were screened. Oh, you heard that. Yeah, my okay. <laughs> Yes, they were shown as a double feature in Japanese cinemas, and that's a part of the uh, Japan America story as well, which is that um, animation in Japan in 1988, which is when those films were released, was not necessarily considered a cinematic art form. It was television, and television in short 30-minute episodes. Uh, really, the, the, the area that Tezuka pioneered, which was TV series, that's what Tezuka focused on. Miyazaki's dream was to turn Japanese animation into a cinematic art form, into what Miyazaki revered as high art. In fact, one of the stories that storylines in the book is Miyazaki's opinion for, of Tezuka, which was not so high, I can tell you. Um, uh, he, he thought Tezuka was a commercial hack who sold his work cheap to TV stations, which in fact he did sell his work very cheap to TV stations. And that's a huge problem in Japan today, because it's hard for anime artists to make money um, off of television series, even though that's a big outlet. But Miyazaki himself pioneered the development of uh, anime in cinema, and as a cinematic art form. And Totoro and Grave of the Fireflies were shown as a double feature because at that time, most Japanese cinemas didn't trust anime. They thought, well, people are gonna, you know, they're gonna pay a thousand yen for just one animation. So we have to couple them up, make it a two for one deal. Um, now, of course, Miyazaki holds the box office records in Japan, so nobody worries about that. But at that time, they were paired, and the funny story is that they were originally shown Grave of the Fireflies first and Totoro second. Anybody can imagine the problem, right? Yeah. People would see Grave of the Fireflies, they'd be weeping, uh, and they'd say, that, that's it, I can't take it and they would exit the cinema, and so nobody would see Totoro. Mm. Obviously, they turned that around, started showing Totoro first, and people would sit and watch the entire double feature, and Totoro and Grave of the Fireflies became classic films. So, good, good comment. Wait, is there a rock band in here? Uh, <laughs> I think next door. Oh, okay. Well, at least that's all right. <laughs> so, yeah. I yes. was just kind of wondering, um, when you kind of get the feeling that religious ideas of the apocalypse come in, and I'm just thinking, you know, I don't know very much about it, but I just finished watching Lost Rider for like a full time, and I'm just wondering your opinion on that. That's such a complicated and great question, the religious sensibility in the Japanese sense of apocalypse, which is very, very different from the conventional Western approach to apocalyptic storylines. And one of the crucial differences, and I think this does have to do with, uh, you know, end of, end, of, end of times Christian uh, traditions. In the Western story of apocalypse, and I want to cite my good friend Susan Napier, who some of you may have read, who's written a lot and spoken a lot about anime. And Susan and I have talked about this, and she's written about this. Traditionally, in the Western apocalypse story, the hero, or the main character, is trying to stave off apocalypse to stop the end of the world from happening, and to save his family or his friends or his, 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 whoever he's close to from the end of the world, make sure that it doesn't happen. That's the narrative tension in the storyline. The Japanese version, by comparison, often begins with the end of the world. Now, somebody mentioned Akira earlier. That's the classic example of that, right? The opening scene is the mushroom cloud, complete destruction of Tokyo, and Yokohama, probably the whole metropolitan area. And our story begins, what, 30 years later, almost 30 yep. years later, in a, in a Neo-Tokyo. So the Japanese story is very often, and you can imagine for a, 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 a people who have been through World War II and experienced the complete destruction of the nation, is of the rebirth after complete destruction and annihilation. So the Japanese version assumes that the world ends. Of course it does. <laughs> of course your cities are destroyed. And you start again. You rebuild. You start over. And I want to mention this in part, again, with reference to what's happening in Japan today. Because, however awful 
the situation. And it is awful. We're talking about tens of thousands of people dead. Still, there are thousands of people unaccounted for. They can't find the bodies. They don't know who they were, who they are. There are no records because the, the, the buildings were destroyed. So it's an awful situation. But there is this word in Japan, you might have heard, gama. Mm -hmm. It refers to a kind of endurance in the face of the, the worst situation. You silently endure and you, you soldier on. And very much the apocalyptic story in Japan is about soldiering on and creating a new world after everything is destroyed. And um, this, of course, was something that I think resonated with certain American fans of a certain generation after what happened, and I'm not comparing it directly, but what happened in the United States in 9 11, 2001. Uh, 2001 which is a brand new experience for a young generation of Americans to see the most famous skyscrapers in the United States completely destroyed in a single day, to see the Pentagon on fire, to have this sense that the United States was under siege and things could be destroyed on a sunny September morning. Felt very much like anime. <laughs> very much less like Hollywood and much more like anime partly for those reasons. But remember, just to quickly identify that the religious base in Japan, if you want to call it religious base, is Buddhist, inherited from, uh, from Asia, and uh, Shinto, which is the national faith. And Shinto is a polytheistic faith, belief in many gods, not a single god. And Shinto is also animistic. So one of the things when we talk about Japanese anime and the fact that so many characters and images are animated, Shintoism is about a spirit even in something like this water bottle. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, I hope Transformers, yeah. the very idea came from Japan, it was for Japanese artists, mm -hmm. and uh, the concept of an automobile that turns into a character with a soul and a personality is very Japanese, very much so. So very different roots than a Judeo-Christian uh, story about apocalypse. Yeah, do you have a mic? Uh, just really quickly, you mentioned sort of the theme of faith and technology for Japanese society. I was wondering if you did any investigation on the defeat of the Yamato, which was actually a very technologically advanced battleship. That's right. And it would seem to sort of counteract that faith in technology that people were trying to develop at that time. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts. Well, and that's an excellent point. If the Yamato, which was Japan's uh, greatest naval vessel, could be sunk, by the Americans, then you gotta make something better. <laughs> so what emerges from the imagination, on the one hand, the great mecha anime genre, you go back to Tetsujin uh, Jujachiko, or Gigantor as he was called here, reverse giant robot out of Japan. Very early series, Gigantor is shown stomping through a city, and if you rewind and slow down, you'll see the Empire State Building. <laughs> when the series was sold to the United States, those buildings were redrawn. It's <laughs> just any old city, folks. Yeah. Uh, that was part of the dream. Obviously, Battleship Yamato, right? Uh, what was it called here? All Star Blazers. Star Blazers. Star Blazers. The dream of that series is a resurrected battleship Yamato from the Japanese Navy that actually soars through space. <laughs> Take that, America. <laughs> See what you can do with that, right? So the imagination and faith in technology and the faith, the imaginative faith in technology that you find in anime and manga was very much driven by post-war dreams of resurrection. And the entire Japanese, you know, economic juggernaut after the war was devoted towards perfecting technology. Remember the Japanese constitution, which was largely drafted by the Americans, prohibits a standing military. So if you can't have a military, maybe you can have a bullet train, right? Maybe you can pour your technology and your engineering into transportation, into giant robots, into robot toys, into dreams of spaceships and battles in space because you're not allowed to have your own standing military. Yes? Um, sorry. This might be a little off base, but um, 
thinking about you know, you know how Tetsu is basically like basically destroying everything again, and you have a lot of themes of characters who almost bring about the end of the world rather than trying to save it from a Western perspective. I'm just wondering what your kind of thoughts were on that motif in anime and manga. It's an excellent um, question. The characters actually trying to, in some ways, destroy the world. The idea and the reactionary approach to a lot, a lot of anime artists were voicing in the 1980s, including, by the way, a Takahata in Grave of the Fireflies. Some of you remember the end of the film, the uh, closing scene of the film is uh, showing the two uh, children as ghosts, obviously, sitting on a hilltop overlooking modern-day Kobe. And a lot of people have asked about that ending, discussed it, and clearly one of the, one of the reasons for that ending is that, um, is that Takahata wanted to show that Japanese should not forget what happened in the war, uh, and not forget those who lost their lives. I'm gonna try to show you, do we have audio? This clip, just in case some of you who haven't seen Akira and don't know what we're talking about here, this is the very opening of the film. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Speaking of faith in technology. <laughs> Draw your attention to the use of silence here too, which is another classic uh, anime uh, aesthetic approach. see this image, think of the crater left in Lower Manhattan after the Twin Towers fell. This idea of an empty space defining uh, an atmosphere or story. Emptiness or dearth. Here's the crater. The story begins <laughs> at the end, if you will. Okay. Um, I just wanted to get that image in your brains. If you somehow hadn't seen Akira, I don't want to assume that everybody has actually seen that film. But that was uh, Akira in the anime story is, is crucial because it was arguably the film that opened the door to non Japanese. Uh, to the power and depth of Japanese animation. Akira was screened uh, in cinemas overseas, debuted in London on the big screen. Uh, Akira also was screened at universities across the United States. Uh, and so a whole generation of Americans suddenly realized the power and depth and psychological richness of Japanese animation, which of course you might not have seen if you've only seen Speed Racer and All-Star Blazers and Gachaman, or the Butcher Gachaman, which is Battle of the Planets, you might not be aware of the richness of cinematic anime from Japan, and Akira really was the pivotal title in uh, opening Americans up to that, and opening Americans up to this apocalyptic vision coming out of Japan. So, another question. Sorry, something has back there. Yeah. Sorry to make you run with the mic. I just have a question. Uh, Germany was the only other country experience the destruction and loss after World War II, like Japan did. And after World War II, they had a tradition in Germany called the Going Home Tradition, which is basically every a little louder. They had a tradition called the Going Home Tradition, where uh, all of the cinema, everything they did was like, avoid the war and talking about the war at all costs and all possibilities. Uh, don't talk about anything bad. There is no apocalypse. There is no death. Um, and then when Germany started to transition away from that in the 70s, there was a huge pushback. Did, did that happen in, in Japan as well? Was there a societal pushback against this apocalyptic depiction of 
fiction in popular culture and that sort of thing? That's an interesting question. If there's any pushback, it's happening now. <laughs> A lot of anime in, in recent years has been, as many of you probably know, light, fluffy, moe, oriented material. Uh, and I'm dead serious about that because you talk to producers in Japan who are pretty frustrated by the current crop of anime that's being made. And it's partly for commercial reasons. Um, the consumer culture for anime in Japan right now is being driven by middle-aged otaku. Uh, male, middle-aged men who are not married. Japan's marriage rate, rate is way down right now. They don't have partners and they drive the market for dating sims like Love Plus and more recent Love Plus Plus, <laughs> another dating sim. And they're driving the market for anime that's being sold in DVD form, box sets and so on, after television series. And uh, they clearly don't have uh, much interest in looking at devastation and questioning Japan's role during the war, etc. So it's actually very depoliticized right now. I don't know if that's a pushback similar to what you're talking about in Germany. But I think it's also, as you were talking, I was reminded of the fact that by comparison to Germany, the Japanese population really didn't reckon with the war. And that was partly because the Americans really didn't want them to. <laughs> the Tokyo trials, by comparison to Nuremberg, Tokyo trials were overseen by one country, the Americans. And many of the Class A war criminals who were on trial in Tokyo were completely exonerated, completely forgiven and free. And that was partly, and I'm going to have to fit this into a couple of minutes, but that was partly because the Americans' goal, largely at that time, was to set up Japan as an ally and a military base. There are today 50,000 U.S. troops in Japan. I gotta tell you how strange it is to take a train an hour outside of Tokyo and watch American fighter planes landing and taking off in Japan. I say strange, I'm not saying that as a political judgment, but as my Japanese friend Kazuki said when we went to the base to watch these planes taking off, he said, can you imagine, Roland, if you could take a train an hour outside of your home in New York City and watch Japanese fighter planes taking off and landing in Long Island? or Russian fighter planes, or, or, or British fighter planes. Can you imagine an hour from your home in New York City? Um, of course I can't. Any other questions? Good, good points made there. Yeah. <laughs> I was just hoping to go back to what you were talking about before as far as the rebirth. It seems like the handling is different between uh, apocalyptic situations that are man-made or, or have a non-natural cause, um, or one that's kind of carried upon by men or by humans, and then natural disasters. What I've always noticed about like, the whole side pieces is that they, it seems like they have a way of dealing with it. It's not great, but like the fishermen in the boats are laying out, like they just, there's nothing else they can do but just deal with it and then, you know, and try their best to move on. Uh, like, is, have you seen, how, how are these matters handled differently between the, when, when the cause is man-made? It's a great, another great question. I feel like I could write essays on all of these questions. Um, I'm a writer, so that's probably why I feel that way. But there's a great, great, great questions. I would say that if you look at, uh, this goes back to what somebody else said earlier, was talking about the, um, the fact that characters in Akira sometimes seem like they want to destroy the world. There's a great sort of thread in Japanese art and novels as well of suspicion of Japan's rapid development, I would say. Otomo himself, the artist who created Akira, uh, and, and before that, Domo, his work often suggests that there's an illness or an evil lurking behind Japan's suddenly consumerist, overgrown, hyper-developed society. That there's something almost inherently wrong with that. That it happens so quickly 
And in a lot of anime and manga, I want to draw your attention to this, you'll notice that whenever traditional Japan is shown in manga or anime, it's Edo-era Japan. It's 16th and 17th century Japan that is cited as traditional. You know, the kimono, the samurai, the geta, sandals. A whole period is skipped over. They never show Meiji period Japan. When after, you know, Matthew Perry, Commodore Perry had opened up Japan to trade and Japan westernized very rapidly, or at least took a lot of elements of Western culture and applied it to Japanese life. No, 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 that's not shown in manga now. Not Meiji, Meiji era Japan. And they skip over, of course, pre-war Japan, the 20th century, the military coup. That's not shown. Now, you might argue that it is shown in films like Akira, not directly, but shown through this reference to corruption, to an extremely corrupt government, to corrupt uh, institutions, destructive institutions. But it's not referred to directly as Japan in 1937, for example. So I think, to answer your question, which is a tough question, I think the depiction of human destruction and human apocalypse often refers to the evil within us. Again, the United States is very rarely referred to in references to World War II. If you go to the Hiroshima Peace Museum, an incredible place, by the way, with, with uh, fragments from left behind after the, uh, the devastation of the atomic bomb, you can hardly find any reference to the United States. It's almost like, oh, this happened, and we're awful. Human beings are terrible, and we can't let this happen again. As if this mass of human beings did this. Not a single country, not an enemy. So the reference to evil, I think, that you find in anime and manga, Japanese popular culture, is often to a vague sense that human beings have evil within them. The destruction of the natural world, I believe, is much more indirect. Again, we mentioned Miyazaki's depiction of the tsunami. That's very rare, actually, in anime and manga. The evil is often perpetuated by humans. And so Miyazaki there, I think one reason that scene stands out is he's actually depicting a tsunami. But of course, as I said earlier, the waves have those same empty Totoro eyes. They don't seem to be actively attacking the humans. They're just doing what nature does. And I think that's the sensibility you feel in Japan and in Japanese popular art as well, that this is what nature does. And part of what nature does is destroy things. And I have to mention this, even though Miyazaki-san probably wouldn't want me to, but when I interviewed him on stage at UC Berkeley in 2009, he made a, a quite provocative comment. Um, many of you probably know that Miyazaki, like a lot of anime artists, are deeply nostalgic. I mentioned Edo-era Japan. Also for a Japan that was not developed, overdeveloped, there's more concrete per square kilometer in Japan than in any other country in the world. It's a lot of concrete, a lot of electrical wires, a lot of development. And uh, Miyazaki's son said, um, you know, sometimes when I look out over the skyscrapers of Tokyo, the city, and how every square centimeter is filled in. I wish a great wave would come and sweep those buildings away. Um, and I think he meant it. He didn't mean that he wishes people would die. And of course, he's been very vocal in support of those suffering in Tohoku, uh, northern Japan, recently. And, and very, he's, he went up there himself to meet people and to sign autographs and to show his support. So I don't mean to make him sound like a cold, curmudgeonly creature. Yeah. But I think in, in, in his work, too, there's this sort of suspicion of Japan's development and that that somehow inherently is maybe evil in a way, the overdevelopment. And not just the overdevelopment, but remember, anime and manga are hybrid art forms. As I said right at the beginning, Tezuka loved Disney and Fleischer. Japanese artists were taking a Western medium, comics and then animation, and applying their own sensibilities to it and their own artistic styles, two-dimensional artistic styles. So these are hybrids from the very beginning. Uh, they're comprised of Western influence and Japanese sensibilities. And I think that's important to remember as well, that you're looking at an art form that is a hybrid 
from the start. The book, Japan America, is apparently on sale down at the uh, dealer's room at the table hosted by a wonderful writer, Peter S. Beagle. Some of you may know his work. He's down there, it's right near the entrance, and I will uh, most happily sign it for you if you're keen to have me do that here. In fact, I'll probably pop down there now for a few minutes, so if you want to get a copy, I'll be happy to sign it for you. I'm doing a couple more panels tomorrow midday, I think at noon, something like that, uh, and another one on Sunday, partly to talk about Japan's approach to intellectual property, which is very problematic in the digital age, as I'm sure you know. There's a lot of anime out there, and you don't have to pay for it. So we're going to talk a little bit about these issues as well that are part of the book. Uh, thank you very, very much for coming today. Great questions.